What up, though, peoples? Seems as my fucking microphone has betrayed me. So I'm back to using my built-in mic on this laptop. The one I bought, it wasn't the greatest, but it did eliminate little shit like the little snap, crackle, and pop. She would hear when I moved around, the simple, the slightest movement. This built-in mic picks up all that dumb shit, so might be able to clean it up do some video editing, but if not, it may suck, so just fucking bear with me. So with that said, I am back doing another video that I am very excited to get done. This video will be in honor of 31 Days of Horror, specifically Day 24. October 24th, which is also my cousin Drew's birthday. So happy birthday, my nigga Drew. Now this video is dedicated to the underappreciated, the underrated, iconic villains in horror movies. Of course, we all know the more popular characters. I'm talking cats like Pinhead, Michael Myers, Jason Voorhees, and Freddy Krueger. My own personal four horsemen of death. But there are also several more. I don't know about several more, but there, there are a few more iconic horror movie villains who I think deserve a little bit more credit. And that's what the purpose of this little video is. Here is so let's break down the five most underrated horror movie villains in history. <laughs> First up is Angela Baker from the Sleepaway Camp franchise. Angela Baker, kind of a tragic story. She was originally born a male, but forced to identify as a female by her crazy-ass auntie, who, since she already had a son, apparently she wanted a daughter also. So with Angela being raised by her auntie, I guess her parents passed away. I don't fucking remember the story like that. But her auntie... Fucking pretty much forced her to be a boy, like dressed her in uh I mean <laughs> dressed her in fucking girl clothes and and pretty much ran with the story that she was a little girl and and then went as far as uh her going to school and to summer camp as a girl. So everyone else thought she was a girl too. But as you may know, at the end of sleepaway camp that fucking ending that still fucking haunts me to this day because it's just so fucking bonkers. Angela is actually a boy and we saw a little ding ding hanging out. She killed the boy that she was feeling. And uh, yeah, so Angela is best known as the transgender fucking psycho slasher. Now, despite all that insanity, Angela is an awesome character. She was a teenage slasher in the original Sleepaway Camp, but in the sequel, she's all grown up. She's still transgender, identifying as a woman, and she's still fucking batshit crazy. Now, what I love about Angela so much is when it comes to killing... She's uh, very inventive. Like, she's not, she ain't just gonna stab your ass. She gonna come up with some shit, elaborate, a nice elaborate plan to take your ass out the game if she got time to plan it out, of course. And she's also, more often than not, she's very happy, chipper, happy go lucky ass. Bursting with the power of positivity, motherfucker. Like, she'll fucking chop your nuts off in one fucking rap, and then the next she's singing Kumbaya. Angela Baker, she's a bit hip 
hypocritical, kind of got that Bible thumping. She thinks everybody should be fucking uh, righteous and doing the right thing. And if you're not, then she going to fucking fuck you up and shit. I don't know if I like that aspect of her, but hey, it's horror. It's a fun love fucking uh, element to her character. And I think it's cool. Now, more than anything, what I would just love to see is a filmmaking crew with the bars to pull off a sleepaway remake in today's fucking hypersensitive culture. I mean a remake that stays true enough to the original. That means keeping the transgender components in play. Oh my god. It would be so epic just to fucking see the just to hear the outrage and I guess absorb some of them tears of motherfuckers whining. If that kind of shit cracks me up. Angela Baker. Next up is Angela Franklin. She's probably even lesser known because she comes from a lesser known horror movie franchise. That being Night of the Demon. Well, maybe it's Night of the Demons. Night of Demons, Night of the Fucking Demons. It's one of those, trust me. Anyway, Angela Franklin, her humble beginning started out as a gothic chick who fucked around with uh, black magic and whatnot. She was kind of an outcast, not very popular and shit, so she spent her free time fucking with this voodoo type of shit, fucking with spirits. So, one day, she fucks around a little, uh, she went a little too deep. Her and her crew had a party at this little, uh, funeral parlor, specifically Hall House, which is, uh, like the central location of most of the films in this franchise. Whoop-de-whoop, the fucking seance goes wrong, terribly wrong, and the evil spirit gets unleashed, and it possesses Angela, and from here on out, Angela, she becomes like the, the main evil demon spirit, who goes on slaughtering motherfuckers and carrying on a franchise. Angela's spirit is actually trapped inside of her house. Like, she can't leave there. So, like, that's her crib and shit. That's just where she hangs out at for eternity and shit. So, why do we love Angela Franklin? Well, for me, it's pretty simple, man. She's a fucking freak. Like, even in the remake and shit, they, they highlighted this probably best in the remake. Like, all the people... She has, like, this thing where she's, uh, trying to, like, recruit more demons and shit. I guess if she can build up a big enough posse, some other fucking voodoo, fucking janky-ass shit, she can gather enough fucking evil fucking Kamehameha magic <laughs> to fucking, uh, break out of this call house fucking uh, radius she strapped in and spread her fucking evil voodoo magic further across the world is what I'm gathering. But most of the demons that she uh, kills, infects or whatever, she does so by some form of sexual intercourse. Some do, she straight up fucks you. She like, give you the pussy, give you some nice demon pussy before she uh steals your soul, and brings you over to her side. She also has a wide range of supernatural abilities. For example, she can use telekinesis, she can teleport, and she's practically immortal. The bitch can be killed, so at the end of the movie and shit, we pretty much have an idea I mean, if you watched the last movie, you know that this bitch is going to pop up in the new one. Because some dumbass motherfucker going to go to the whole house. And this bitch is just going to pop up out of nowhere like she's just fucking Betty Boo. Hey, you. 
Like she just lived her like a regular motherfucker. That's how when the when the fucking sequel comes on, you see some dumbass that go up to the house and they see Angela. She just looks like a regular bitch. And couple seconds go past, she realize she fucking reveals that she's the demon bitch and whatever, whatever. But Angela, she's a freak. She's got a wide range of wizardry type powers and shit. And she's got a lot of fucking brutal kills under her belt. And for that reason, I think she's pretty fucking cool. We keep our feminine thing rolling with Mary Lou Maloney. And she's from prom from the Prom Night franchise. Now this shit is kinda fucking fluky because Prom Night 1 has nothing to do with Prom Night 2 and 3. It's like one of those things where the the fucking filmmakers wanted to capitalize on the popularity of one movie, so they used the title to like rope it into the franchise, even though they're totally unconnected. This is one of those cases. Prom Night 1 it's like a slasher movie. It's kind of like a Halloween type of flick. It even got old girl Johnny Lee Curtis in it. And Prom Night 2 or 3, that's like some super, some more supernatural type of shit with some slasher elements in it. Anyway, Mary Lou Maloney in 1957, she's just a, the typical bitchy high school student, high school senior to be exact. She's uh, at her prime and shit, fucking around with some dudes and shit, giving niggas hand jobs and whatnot and shit while she's uh, waiting to be uh, crowned as the home of the prom queen, I mean. But she's such a bitch and shit, she's got a lot of haters, including this one dude she blew off. So he gets with his homeboys and they uh, set up a little prank and shit. I was supposed to smoke bomb her ass when she uh got her fucking coronation moment going on. But this shit goes terribly wrong. This bitch catches on fire and burns to death and shit. Pretty fucked up for Mary Lou. Thirty years later, some bitch is fucking around with Mary Lou's dress. Somehow she unleashes her spirit. And Mary Lou, she's back with a vengeance. And she's out to get revenge on her, pretty much the whole school, but she's mainly targeting the surviving members of her senior class who fucked her over. But what do we love about Mary Lou? There's many things, actually. I actually think that she's uh, she has a, a little bit of Freddy Krueger in her, man. And this comes from her fucking uh, supernatural powers. For instance, she can shape shift. She uses voice manipulation, like some Terminator shit, like hey, house wolfy type of thing. <laughs> you know what the fuck I mean? The bitch can also fly. She can use electricity in a way that would impress Elder Guy Raiden. She can do a lot of shit, pretty much like Freddy Krueger. She also has that fucking, uh, that charming, douchey personality. She's pretty much as big a bitch in death as she was in real life. So that really, uh, rounds out her character in a very likable way. If you were kind of sick motherfucker who appreciates that shit. Now, Mary Lou... She's played by a different character in the, in the third movie. So, uh, I mean, a different actress, my bad. So the character is kind of different. In the third one, she's more like a fucking sex fiend. Bitch trolling for dick and shit. She, she meets this, uh, this one dude who she uh, takes a liking to, and she's trying to... Uh, I guess get him to bring her back and exact her revenge through him. So she spends a lot of time fucking this nigga and shit. But she also, uh, 
He's also on her little murderous onslaught, so we get some very interesting kills in the third movie as well. But she's also, she still got her fucking supernatural powers. She can make shit happen at the drop of a dime, so. Yeah, man, Mary Lou, he's pretty cool, man. I, I was, I knew about Prom Night 2 and 3 and all that, but I didn't really, I wasn't really a fan of him. I guess I seen the second one probably and it didn't impress me. But after revisiting it, I thought that was pretty cool. And Mary Lou is definitely a villain worthy of the icon status. Next up, we have the Tall Man from the Phantasm franchise. Phantasm, the sequels, they're kind of iffy, but the first two are classic movies that I enjoy very, very much. And of course, a big part of that is due to the Tall Man. Now, the Tall Man, he's an undertaker with supernatural capability, and he's also a very shady motherfucker, and what do we know about the tall man, he's very mysterious, so there is a lot that we don't know, but what we do know is this dude has a penchant for robbing graves of their dead bodies, and then taking these bodies and compressing them into these Killer Ewok druid type of motherfuckers, little midget dwarf things. <laughs> and he also, I think he uses like the brains of the dead people and like integrates them into those epic, iconic little flying spears that have the little razor blades in them that are fucking poke you in your fucking forehead and drill into your shit and suck out all your blood and just leave you dry like Janet Jack me. So, the tall man. Now, what do we love about the tall man? Like I said, he's a very mysterious cat, so it's hard to really dig into his capabilities as far as, uh, being comparable to a cat like Freddy or Mary Lou Maloney. But we do know that he has the ability to cross dimensions pretty much at the drop of a dime. This is where he got all his crazy shit going on. And we've seen the characters Reggie and Michael and all of them. We've seen them cross these dimensions. Every so, every so often to try to get a glimpse of what this fucking dude is really up to and the sequels get kind of, get so wild that I kind of really lost the concept of what the fuck is going on, but I gathered that the tall man is trying to build an army of undead or, or of dead people from this dimension and fight a war in other dimensions? I don't know. But the dude has probably made a DMT so he can just hop, pop, fucking hop, and pop through fucking portals at will. Beyond that, he's just a big, imposing motherfucker. Dude is like tall as hell. And I believe, I think I read that they said that they purposely made his suit like extra tight to make him look even more intimidating and imposing. I guess I can see that, even though he look kind of goofy with his shit, his pants all flooding like that. But tight suit or not, I think he looks pretty fucking intimidating and frightening. And based on his fucking presence alone, he's a badass. Being able to expand across four movies, an iconic franchise like Phantasm, right, man, he's definitely underrated. <laughs> Last but not least, we have the one, the only, Horace Reginald Pinker from the movie Shocker. 
who is Horace Pinker? He's a serial killer with dedicated family values. And by that, I mean when he run up in your crib, he killing everybody in that motherfucker. Moms, grandmas, aunties, cousins, dogs, and all. Because of these horrific crimes, Horace got his ass put on death row, and he was executed almost immediately via electrocution. But our Horace, apparently he planned for this shit, and he doesn't die a typical death. He comes right back. Now, what we love about Horace... Hey, man, he's just a dick, man. And sometimes that's all it takes to be likable in a fucking environment like horror movies. He has that presence and shit, man. He has, like, a real a real grimy feel to him and shit. Mind you, some of his lines are a bit outdated because, you know, this is an 80s movie, so you got that... It's kind of drizzled in that 80s sheets, but... Overall, I thought he was very convincing, and he came across as a little bit frightening, intimidating, whatever fucking words you want to use there if you want to be one of them motherfuckers who scared by movies and shit. Now, Horace Pinker, once he, uh, he defeats death by, uh, Essentially becoming one with electricity, I guess he was on some voodoo type of shit. He uh, did a seance type of thing right before he got electrocuted in the chair. So, like, he uh, bonded with these uh, electrical currents and shit to the point where he can, like, travel through TVs and radios and Nigga can stick his motherfucking finger in a socket and he just he's just off to Comcast cable, that type of shit. And he also has the power to enter people's dreams. And this may have something to do with the fact that this movie was directed by Wes Craven. So you see a few Nightmare on Elm Street elements in this movie, which I thought was pretty cool. And another thing that I gotta give it to Horace for is that he aspired a fucking copycat. Not in real life, thank God. I'm talking about in cinema. And this takes place, this fuckery occurs in a movie called House 3. Another one of those movies that didn't have shit to do with the first two. It's totally his own movie. And it totally has a rip-off character called Meat Cleaver Max, who was like, he's like Horace Pinker in another movie and shit. The, the damn, the fucking killer and the plot is pretty much been ripped from Shocker. I mean, it's a decent movie on its own, but it's hard to give it too much credit because they ripped it off from Shocker, man. So, yeah. Horace Pinker started drawing inspiration from other filmmakers right away. And another thing I have to give it to Mr. Pinker for is he's the only horror movie villain on this list who never got a sequel. I thought Shocker was pretty fucking cool. I'd love to see a sequel because I don't think we could definitively say that my man Horace was knocked out the box completely. But hey, a part two never rolled around. Since Hollywood is remake crazy these days, maybe we'll get a rebooted version. I think it would be cool to see with this updated filmmaking technology, different fucking minds of filmmaking. I have some ideas that can take that original concept and move it ahead in some, in some more interesting and innovative areas. Whatever, whatever. So, that is our list, top five most iconic, underrated, underappreciated horror movie villains. If you appreciate this type of content, you can find similar material 
on my website, countcrewpublications.com for 31 Days of Horror. Maybe a little bit more coherent as most of these posts are written out text. Not me trying to fucking fumble my way through words and shit for 20 minutes. So if you can read, like to read, you might enjoy those. Check it out. Peace.